Right, welcome. Let us go on with our lecture. At the moment, we are in the process of developing a very general formalism to discuss and compute Feynman graphs, which is based on alpha parametrization, whereby the loop integrations is replaced by integrations over alpha variables. And uh, furthermore, we uh, last time developed an additional generalization of that alpha formalism with so-called U variables, which allow us to treat arbitrary numerators of Feynman graphs as well. So here I briefly review this formalism once again. We introduced it step by step by going to further and further optimized and generalized formalisms. And here is the final version of the formalism, which we will use throughout the lecture today to derive further properties. And actually, the lecture today will be exclusively devoted to derivatives applied in this formalism. And remember, there are two kinds of interesting derivatives for us. In the distant past, we have discovered that we can treat alpha variables uh, by going into sectors. And then for each subgraph, there will be a scaling variable called t for the associated subgraph. And then uh, an integral over these t variables corresponds to the UV divergences of the Feynman graphs. And the UV divergences can be extracted by taking derivatives with respect to t at t equals 0. Therefore, derivatives with respect to t are interesting. And today, we will learn a lot about derivatives with respect to t applied to all objects in our formalism. Second, the u variables that we introduced last time allow to obtain numerators in an arbitrary form by taking derivatives with respect to those u variables. And so we will also discuss derivatives with respect to u. And as we already indicated in the exercise last time, there will be relations between uh, objects for the full graph and objects for the reduced graph and the subgraph if we go to a specific sector where we have a full graph and an associated subgraph. And this is the situation we will consider throughout today. And uh, so let me briefly start by reviewing again the final version of the formalism, which we called notation star the last time, specific to our lemma that we proved in section uh, 3, 4, 3. So we use a full graph G. Inside of it, there is a subgraph H. And then we showed that we can use subgraph aware variables, which are those ones here, um, also in a reordered form. Namely, we have momenta for the subgraph. And this is an unambiguous set of momenta. So there is no overcounting. One external momentum is removed. Um, because it can be obtained by momentum conservation. So this is an independent set of external momenta of the subgraph, uh, vh minus one of them. These are the u variables for the subgraph, one for each internal line of the subgraph. These are the independent external momenta of the reduced graph g over h. And these are the u variables for the reduced graph g over h. And this set of variables is on the one hand nicely decomposed into subgraph and reduced graph, but it also um, is a full set of variables needed to describe the full graph g. And uh, today I will use an abbreviation for this vector in this basis called capital Q to treat it in a nice way in equations. Then we have shown that the loop integrals in this formalism can be reduced to a big matrix M in this basis. And this matrix M contains all of the information from it, plus this, uh, these variables. We can reconstruct the full expression for the loop integral, including the semantic polynomial U, which is the determinant of M up to a factor, and also this exponent E to the IW, which is also expressed in terms of this M. So M was a block matrix. I didn't write it down today, but we decomposed it the last time in this way, and we will use this decomposition today. So first of all, there is an essential matrix from which we split off the t dependence if we go um, to rescaled variables for the subgraph. This t matrix is a block matrix where uh, the subgraph block is rescaled in terms of this uh, t variable. So the q's are rescaled by t to the minus 1, the u's are rescaled by t. 
Then uh, this interesting matrix M tilde has a block structure which contains on the one hand a diagonal block matrix M hat, which is given here. So it consists directly of the M matrix for the subgraph and the M matrix for the reduced graph and blocks on the off diagonal, uh, zeros on the off diagonal blocks. So this M hat plus a T dependent object which I called BHG, and this BHG is a block matrix with mostly zeros, zeros on the diagonal blocks, and also in the off-diagonal blocks there are many zeros, and the only non-zero entries are here, the incidence matrix which connects the full graph to the subgraph uh, with prefactor minus two, minus two BHG. And here it's the transpose of the same thing, so this is a symmetric matrix. By the way, all the matrices here on the blackboard are symmetric matrices, and which we can use also in the calculations today. So in this way we can decompose our big matrix M, which contains all the information. So for the calculations today, it's also useful to introduce projection operators onto these various subspaces. And I will just give them always obvious names, P with some index. For example, P sub H uh, projects on the full subgraph space. So in this block notation, 1, 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 0, P with index UH would project onto only this subspace of that lowest block here. So it is a block matrix with three big zero blocks and then in the smaller block there are still three zeros and only this one and so on. So the notation should be obvious. And then you can uh, directly uh, see some relationships which can be used in calculations. So for instance, if you take this block matrix here with lots of zero blocks and you multiply from the left with this projection on the subspace uh, H, then it means you take only uh, from this matrix the upper, um, the upper blocks and the lower blocks are set to zero. That means this product uh, multiplies this here with zero and that remains. So only the upper block remains and the other one goes to zero. So that is actually the same as if you multiply the same matrix from the right with the projection on the G space, which has a one here, because that would mean that you set the left block to zero and the right block to a non-zero value. So this is actually the same. So you can pull through such a projection and then out of H you get PG. And then you also see that actually in this block, the only non-zero element is uh, the one in the upper block of this block. Therefore, multiplying with PG is the same as multiplying with PUG, which has this block structure here. So these are kinds of simplifications that we can use in our calculations. And now just as a reminder, these are the full expressions for our uh, loop integrations, uh, which contain E to the IW, and the W is the interesting object, and it is now in this formalism simply constructed as Q transpose times m to the minus one times Q. This is the full W for the full graph. And the W for the subgraph, H, could be obtained using the same notation in this way. So this is the, uh, the M for the subgraph, but with T dependence factored out. So how do we get the full uh, subgraph M? We have to multiply with this T matrix also to the minus one, and we have to get rid of this, so we need to multiply with the projector PH. So then we can express WH as Q transpose times T to the minus one M hat to the minus one PH times T to the minus one times Q. So it's a bit long-winded, but it's a very systematic and actually simple expression. And in this way, we have set up a formalism by which we can treat all the elements of the full graph, subgraph, reduced graph, and we can now obtain a lot of useful um, and far-reaching relationships between them. So let us begin today by asking the following question. Let us consider a subgraph in the full graph and ask what are actually the external momenta of the subgraph. So 
So here I draw again our usual well-known example. And as usual also, I will use this sub-loop here, the one-loop sub-diagram, which is obvious as the subgraph that we consider. So this is our subgraph H, and this is the full graph G. And now I want to ask, what is actually the ex set of external momenta of the subgraph? Just to check. What are the external momenta of the subgraph? And let's fully introduce our uh, systematic um, formalism. So first, we have ver uh, external momenta for each vertex, so also for those ones here. And we label them in uh, the order uh, associated with this um, setup. So this is vertex 1, 2 for the subgraph, and vertex 3, 4 for the remainder of the full graph. And the first lines, 1, 2, are in the subgraph, and then the other lines, 3, 4, 5, are outside of the subgraph. Okay, so what are now the external momenta of the subgraph? And uh, there are two answers to this. First, we can consider the subgraph in isolation. Let's consider the subgraph in isolation. Then we have just this graph here with external lines or external momenta 1 and 2 and internal lines 1 and 2. And then, of course, the external momenta are P1 and P2. They are defined as incoming, and the sum of them is 0 by definition. OK, next question. What are the external momenta of the subgraph when we consider it as a part of the bigger graph? So, if we consider the subgraph as a part of the full graph, then the external momenta are more complicated. So, first of all, here comes in the momentum P1 from that line, but also the momentum from this line number 3 flows into the subgraph. And then it depends on the order of the line whether we define the momentum of line 3 as going in that direction or in this direction. So let's define some direction. Let's say, for example, in this direction. And line number 4 goes in that direction here. Then, clearly now, in this notation, the incoming momentum at the left, Rp1 minus the momentum L3, which is the line momentum of this line number 3, uh, with minus because uh, L3 flows in the uh, opposite direction. And on the other vertex, flows in P2 plus L4. So this is now a little bit more complicated. And what is the general way to write down those external momenta for a subgraph which is inserted into a full graph? Well, we can write it down very explicitly, uh, including the sign, using our incidence matrix. The external momentum pi, uh, sorry, of a subgraph at vertex i would then be pi, which is the truly external momentum from outside of the full graph, but then plus all the momenta which come from lines of the full graph which are not in the subgraph uh, multiplied with the appropriate line momentum. So we can write this as sum over k, all lines k, which are in the subgraph but outside, uh, sorry, in the full graph but outside the subgraph. So these are the lines in the reduced graph g over h. And then we take the incidence matrix B i k times the line momentum L k. And then this incidence matrix uh, multiplies exactly the correct uh, propagator momenta uh, with the appropriate plus or minus sign uh, to obtain the generalized form of this expression. So that is very nice. And we can now make it even better by going to the independent set of momenta.
So the independent set of momenta, which correspond to our basis over there, this QH underscore is the independent set of momenta of the subgraph. And it corresponds to the reduced incidence matrix small b that we have already defined. And so we can directly write uh, the external momenta in this basis are QH underscore index i plus sum over all uh, possible values of k for this block of the incidence matrix, which we called BHG, which is the block which sits here in our capital BHG matrix. So BHG index IK times uh, line momentum LK. These are the external momenta. Well, that is very nice, but now, uh, we remember that in our formalism, actually, the line momenta don't exist anymore because we have carried out all the integrals over the line momenta, and the line momenta can be accessed in the alpha formalism by derivatives with respect to u. So, what we really can do now in our formalism to have an expression of the external momenta is the following. So we can say Q sub i, uh, Q h i, um, minus i uh, times sum over k b h g with index i k, derivative d by d u g uh, with index k. This is exactly the expression. And then this uh, derivative with respect to the variables u g comma k give exactly the line momentum LK, which is a momentum of a propagator in the full graph but outside of the subgraph. And it is multiplied with the appropriate block of the reduced incidence matrix. So in our formalism, this is the expression for the external momenta of the subgraph H, which sits inside of the bigger graph G. And now let us uh, give us a name of this. Let us define a new object which uh, is motivated by this. And uh, let's call it Q uh, partial, which is uh, the following. It's this Q uh, over there, but where we re replace the um, Q variables for the subgraph by this expression, including the derivatives, so that uh, the external momenta of the subgraph are replaced by the external momenta of the subgraph, uh, which sits inside the full graph. So this is the normal Q, um, sorry, or let me do it explicitly first, Q sub H. Uh, let's get rid of the uh, explicit indices and use matrix notation. So then this is just Q sub H minus I matrix BHG multiplied with a vector uh, d by d u g. This is the expression. And then the rest is unchanged, u h q g underscore and u g. Okay. This is our new object. And this is, of course, the same as the old q plus an extra term. And the extra term appears only in the upper um, uh, block of this vector but we can write it in matrix notation using this matrix capital BIG. The capital BIG contains a minus two, so this makes this minus i into a plus i over two times the big matrix BHG. And then in order to um, extract only the component in the upper block, we need to introduce this projector on this UG space and then we can just write this as a derivative with respect to the entire vector Q transpose. So Q transpose then would contain all the derivatives, but times this projector gives just uh, the derivative with respect to UG. And then this block matrix multiplication reproduces exactly this expression. Okay. So this is now an interesting object, Q partial, contains the normal Q plus a shift, 
which means that we insert the subgraph into the full graph. And in fact, uh, let us define this also as a mathematical operation. Let's call it an insertion operation, which means that the subgraph take, is taken first in isolation, and then it is inserted into the full graph. Which means that basically we uh, apply exactly this replacement that Q is replaced by this entire sum. And the name for this is, we call it U sub H. This notation is taken from the Brighton Lohner Meison paper. U sub H of an expression X is defined as the expression X with the replacement Q replaced by this Q partial. In other words, the subgraph momenta are shifted by this derivative, which means we take into account the line momenta of the full graph, which flow into the subgraph. So the index H here means that the replacement rule is of course specific to the subgraph which is chosen because this incidence matrix block is of course specifically designed to uh, describe the subgraph and therefore this is a subgraph specific replacement rule. Okay, so this is a, let's say, very abstract notation but the meaning of it is quite physical. Let us just uh, mention some calculational rules of this. Of course, this is a linear operation. If you have a sum of two expressions and apply the replacement rule, uh, this is the same as applying the replacement rule for the sum. So no question about it. And you can also, if you have a product and uh, you have repl uh, replace the Qs in the product, it is the same as replacing first the individual factors and then multiplying. So let's say uh of x times uh of y is equal to uh of x times y. But there is maybe one thing to notice if these expressions here can be very general expressions, for example, expressions containing derivative operators act uh, onto some something else, um, then this replacement rule still holds. However, uh, what must not happen in order for this rule to work is uh, that the x and y expressions do not contain the variables ug themselves, because otherwise this derivative, uh, which is generated by this ug operation, would act in a non-trivial way on this x and y. So these rules hold if x and y uh, do not contain the variables ug. Let me also just squeeze here at the bottom some additional notation which we will use in this lecture today, which is a very technical notation. Uh, but uh, it is the best moment now to explain it because you see we are now de dealing with derivative operators. So if you take any expression x and apply this replacement rule, then after you applied it, this thing here is a derivative operator because it contains d by dug, which acts on something else which comes afterwards. For example, this might act on e to the iw or some other part of the loop integration. On the other hand, inside of this expression x, we might also want to take some derivatives. And so we need to be clear on when we have derivatives, on what do those derivatives act. And so sometimes we will want that uh, certain derivatives act only inside of this uh, but not uh, to whatever comes to the right of it. And so let's just uh, make this clear by introducing such a notation. So for example, if you have here any expression and then somehow, for example, the derivative d by dt times one then if I write it like this, 
square brackets d by dt times one, then I mean that this derivative acts on everything that comes here in the round bracket, and afterwards it acts on one which uh, gives zero, but it doesn't act on anything outside of the square bracket. So just as a notation. If I don't use this notation, then I have here just d by dt, and this might act on anything which comes even outside of this u h operation, okay? So just to make that clear. This means that the derivative acts only here. After having defined these uh, replacement rules for inserting a subgraph into the full graph, let us now describe the lemma that will uh, define the rest of our lecture today. So it is a lemma on derivatives of all these objects, M, W, uh, and uh, U, specific to the full graph and the chosen subgraph. Let me try uh, to write down first four statements that we are going to prove. And all of the statements uh, are in line with this intuition that we have that derivatives uh, and in general relationships um, associated with the subgraph can be related uh, to objects of the subgraph itself. So derivatives of the full W with respect to T, where T is a subgraph variable, can be related to derivatives of WH and so on. So this is the idea. Let me write down first actually the left-hand sides of the expressions that we want to prove. So you see the system that we have. So lemma A is the following. So we have on the left-hand side of the equation derivative of the full W with respect to our subgraph variables uh times e to the iw, okay? So this is a, basically, uh, you could also say d by the uh of e to the iw, that is the same thing using the chain rule. So we take the derivative of the full e to iw with respect to subgraph u variable, and we take the first derivative. B, we take many derivatives of the same kind, d by d u h to the power k acting on e to the i w again. So the first is a special case of the second where k is one. And here, of course, we have suppressed the indices. So actually, each u h has an index uh, specifying which line of the subgraph we are actually talking about. So this is to be understood in quotation marks. Then, expression C, t derivative, d by dt, of determinant of m tilde to the power minus d over 2 times e to the iw. Okay. This expression is exactly the one which appears inside of the loop integrals. So this is the semantic polynomial u, where the t variable is factored out to the appropriate power. This is the usual exponential function which appears in the integral. And both of them uh, might depend on t. And we take the t derivative, first t derivative of it. So, and uh, then the next generalization, d, is everything combined. We take k t derivatives. And we have an arbitrary function, let's call it z of h of derivatives minus i d by d u h. So this is a, any polynomial in those derivatives of the u variables with any index of the subgraph lines. And we act with all these derivatives on the same object determinant m tilde to the power minus d over 2 times e to the iw. So these are all the left-hand sides of our lemma. So in increasing complexity, so basically uh, all the previous ones are a special case of the case d, but the proof is easier and more systematic if we go in this order. 
Anyway, we take derivatives of arbitrary shape and form with respect to all the subgraph variables to the scaling variable t and to the subgraph u's of that expression which appears in the full um, loop integral for the full graph g. Now what are the right hand sides of all these expressions? The claim is that in case a this derivative of the full w can be related to the derivative of the wh for the subgraph. wh derivative with respect to uh we have the same prefactor i but now what we have to do is we have to apply this insertion operation from before, which means we take into account that the external momenta of the subgraph now have to be replaced by whatever they are when the subgraph appears in the full graph. So we need to apply this replacement rule onto that derivative and then multiply with the remaining e to the i w of the full graph. And now you see the trick is that this object here is a derivative operator where derivatives appear with respect to the ug variable and ug appears in the full graph. So that is a complicated expression. Here we have a normal product and here we have a simpler derivative inside but then we do a replacement and in the end we have a derivative of the full e to i w with respect to uh, u g. So you might also say it in this way. On the left hand side you take a derivative with respect to the subgraph variables u h. On the right hand side you have some expression which actually um, means you take a derivative of e to the i w with respect to the u g variables. Okay, Good. And so it goes on. So the next has a similar right hand side, uh, and here uh, again a multifold derivative of this u, uh, wh appears, however it's a little bit more complicated and we need to use this notation here to write down what it really is. We uh, write it in the following way, d by the uh derivative operator plus i times the wh derivative with respect to uh and the whole thing to the power k and then acting on one which means that those derivatives if we um, okay and uh, the whole thing is applied on e to the iw. Let me immediately tell you what that means as an example. So for k equal 2 for example what it means is that we have the following d by d u h plus i d w h derivative with respect to u h and the whole thing square. So once again, acting on one. So that means this derivative here this derivative operator d by d u h, it acts only on the constant function one so that does nothing. It gives zero by definition in terms of this notation. So that gives zero. So what we really have is uh, two terms. We have a square of the derivative and we have this derivative acting on that. So we have two terms, one i times second derivative of wh with respect to uh plus i times dwh with respect to uh square. And this expression is a very familiar and natural expression. It corresponds essentially to taking the second derivative with respect to u of e to the i wh. So if you take the second derivative of this expression with respect to u, that's exactly what you get. Uh, you get, uh, using the chain rule, either two times the derivative acting on one w or uh, two derivatives acting on different w factors. So you see that this structure is essentially uh, the same thing as if you would apply just two derivatives on e to the i w h but the e to the i w h doesn't appear anymore here in this. But that notation essentially 
means the same thing. So it has this structure. So it's a natural structure, but the notation is a little bit complicated. But the meaning is hopefully understandable. What is the right hand side here? If we take the first t derivative, if we take the first t derivative, we get something simple again. Namely, we get the analog of that. We get simply i times dwh with respect to t times e to the iw. And again, um, I uh, stress here on the left hand side. We have one t derivative of the whole expression. Oh, sorry, um, I forgot the determinant. Determinant m tilde to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i w. So again, here we take the derivative only of the wh with respect to t. Then we transform it into this derivative operator with derivatives with respect to ug. Those derivatives only act on the w because only that depends on ug, but uh, it acts uh, and is multiplied with the full expression. So again, essentially the derivative is replaced by a derivative of uh, the subgraph wh. And so in the last case, the same thing happens. So the natural thing happens, namely we get uh of the appropriate subgraph derivatives. The only problem is that those subgraph derivatives now have to be uh, written down in a quite complicated way using this notation. But what it actually means is the natural thing which you could expect also from here. But let me write down the explicit form. UH sum over J from zero to K. So K is the number of T derivatives. So we have a binomial because we have essentially a product rule. So this t derivative can in the end either act on this or on that. And uh, therefore we have this um, product rule which gives rise to this binomial sum with these coefficients here. And then we have the following. Either we have j t derivatives acting on the zh, zh. And in the set H, we have this replacement, the d by du H is replaced by this here. So we get set H of minus i d by du H plus d by du H of w H according to this notation here. And uh, so the derivatives end here. So this is one term of the product rule and then uh, times derivatives of the other object which give us uh, the same as um, uh, here, namely t derivative plus i times derivative of wh with respect to t to the power k minus j acting on one again. So the derivatives end here. And then the UH operation ends here. And then all of this is applied onto determinant m tilde to the power minus d over 2 times e to the iw. OK, so that is our lemma. So again, I stress on the left hand side, we have all sorts of derivatives with respect to t and u. And in the last line, we have the most general case, just an arbitrary polynomial in derivatives with respect to all t and u variables of this full expression which appears in the loop integration of the full graph. And on the right hand side, we replace all derivatives of derivatives of subgraph w. So here, the derivatives with respect to u are replaced by only derivatives of the subgraph wh. And this object here means something like this. So it gives the structure that you would obtain from taking derivatives of e to the i w h. That's exactly its structure. But then in addition, there are t derivatives applied by a product rule either on this object, where there is here a t dependence, and that object where there is an explicit t derivatives of w h. 
And all of that is then a differential operator with respect to UG, and those UG derivatives act on that remaining expression. So that is our lemma, and let us now prove it. Some comments on the proof. The proof is actually not completely easy. However, we will organize it in a way which makes it hopefully most transparent, and we will go in the following step. Let me just give some comments on the level of difficulty of each of the steps. Part A is very simple, and it will amount to a direct calculation. So we just calculate directly from left to right and uh, see that it works out. That is a five-line uh, proof or so. Part B is then even easier. It is done by induction. So once we know part A, which is the case k equal 1, we can go by induction to any higher k, and that is very simple. Part C is the most complicated by far, and so we will spend most time on part C. And actually, part D is then again obtained by induction because it uh, rests on the other three lines here. And uh, the other three lines are the special case of this for k equal 1 or k equal 0. And so um, we will first prove part D, actually, by assuming part C. Then we will see that uh, this will follow quite uh, in a straightforward way. And then finally, we will spend some time on the proof of this part C. And then uh, once we have done that, we have the full lemma, and we know all these expressions, which give us the necessary relationships between the full graph and the reduced and the subgraphs. So let me clean the blackboard. And then let's go through the proofs step by step. So we have cleaned the blackboard, and we will now go through the proof of the lemma, starting with part A and then progressing. I have listed here, again, the most important definitions. So our full W for the full graph is given by simply Q transpose M to the minus 1 times Q. M is decomposed like this into this T matrix for the T dependence. M hat, which is block diagonal. B H G, which is block off diagonal. And this is the only T dependence of uh, this bracket here. And our replacement rule, Q partial, is uh, written like this using this BHG matrix. So let us use this to prove now our part A. Let us begin with the left-hand side of part A. The left-hand side is given I times derivative of W with respect to UG times E to the IW. And uh, OK, let us write it explicitly. We have the derivative d by duh of this expression, q transpose m to the minus 1 times q times e to the iw. So what happens if we act with this derivative on these u variables? So the q's contain the u's as one of their block entries. <coughs> The expression is symmetric, so basically it's a square expression in the variables uh. Therefore, because of the symmetry, we get just a factor 2 times the derivative of this q transpose with respect to uh. And that derivative <coughs> gives basically a unit matrix in the block corresponding to uh. So, and the unit matrix uh, according to this block is our projection operator. So we can write this as i times the projection operator on this uh block times m to the minus 1 times q times e to the iw. And now I forgot the factor 2. So times 2 because of the symmetry of this expression. OK, that's the left-hand side. And now let us look at the right-hand side and calculate it and see uh, whether the results are actually the same as this one here. Okay. So on the right-hand side, we have this uh, UH replacement rule acting on I times the derivative of WH with respect to those UH variables. This is then a differential operator which acts on E to the IW. 
So, but first let us evaluate uh, the argument of this UH operation. So the argument of this UH operation is the derivative here of WH. I didn't write it over there again, but the WH could also be expressed in terms of um, Q transpose, but inside of it, we don't have the full M to the minus one, but we have the M hat to the minus one and the projection operator again. But otherwise, we get here again two times I, the two from the symmetry again, then the projection operator onto this UH space, and then comes the rest from uh, the expression of WH, which is T to the minus one, then M hat to the minus one, then this projection operator PH times T to the minus one, and times Q. That is the entire expression, uh, directly copied from the first blackboard from today, the, the derivative with respect to UH in the same way. Then all of this acts on E to the IW. Now, we can do some simplifications here, which uh, are typical for what we need to do today. So here you see projection operators. This is a projection operator onto a subspace of the subgraph space. This is a projection operator onto the subgraph. So actually this is block diagonal, this is block diagonal, so we can pull the projection operator PH through up to here. This is completely identical because all these matrices are block diagonal. And then the product of this projector times that projector gives this projector because that is a subspace of this. So we can leave this out. You can just drop it without changing the expression. So therefore, let us go on. Then we can evaluate our replacement rule. The replacement rule just tells us to replace Q by Q partial, which is this sum of Q and uh, the derivative operator. So we can just uh, directly write it down. So instead of UH, we now have just the direct expression, two times I times this projector, PUH, T to the minus one, M hat to the minus one, T to the minus one, and then this Q delta, which is Q plus I over two, BHG times the projector BPUG, derivative with respect to Q transpose. And all of this now acts onto E to the IW. And now you see totally explicitly how this derivative operator UH acts. It contains here this explicit D by D Q transpose, which acts on W, and W again is this expression which contains Q and Q transpose. So evaluating the derivative is now very easily possible. So we can directly evaluate it, two times I, P U H, T to the minus one, M hat to the minus one, T to the minus one. And then here in the round bracket, we get Q that remains, and we can factor out E to the IW. And now, uh, from this derivative, that gives us the E to the IW times an inner derivative, which is I times the derivative of W with respect to Q transpose, and that is two times M to the minus one times Q. So we can write plus I over two, BHG, PUG, then times the inner derivative, two times i, m to the minus one times q. Okay, so it might look like a long-winded expression, but it's a very um, explicit and direct uh, expression which contains just matrix products of all of our uh, objects here. So now we can, for example, again, leave out some factors to make the expression simpler. So let's look at this projection operator, for example. So the projection operator uh, acts on this BHG, which is anyway a block diagonal matrix, and we already said 
that this projection operator is the same as if we just project on the subspace G, not only on the UG, but on the fuller subspace G, because that anyway has only a non-zero entry in this UG block. But then this would be the same as multiplying with PH from the left, but multiplying with PH from the left is unnecessary because there is already this PUH here on the very, very left. And so we can leave out this uh, factor without changing the expression. Then what else can we do? We can uh, factor out the Q from the right. So Q from the right and then um, we can combine I over two times two I gives minus one. So overall, this is the same as writing Q on the right, and then in the bracket we have just one minus m to the sorry minus bhg times m to the minus one. That's the entire expression that we have. And now we just need to massage a little bit this remaining factor. Let me also add here the following factor. So. Here we have this factor t to the minus one, and uh, here we can also freely add, if we want, a projector pH on the subspace of the H block. Now let's uh, simplify this factor. pH t to the minus one times one minus pHg m to the minus one. What is that actually? So pH t to the minus one. Let's write here the one as m times m to the minus one. Then we can factor out m minus bhg times m to the minus one. m to the minus one is now on the um, right. Then um, we can also write the m as t times m tilde times t. And here, the B can be written as uh, the following. Um, right, so let me pull the T to the minus one inside of the bracket, so PH. Then we have here M to the minus one, uh, M tilde, sorry, M tilde times T, the T uh, cancels here. And here we act with a t to the minus one on this block matrix from which only the upper block contributes. And then uh, the only thing that contributes from the t to the minus one on this is the element on the very top block. And the element on the very top block of t to the minus one is just the factor t. So we get t to the minus one times bhj in this subspace is just variable t times bhg times m to the minus one. And we can actually also freely add here a capital T because uh, then from this BHG now only the upper right block contributes and if we multiply that with T from the right then from the T only the lower right block contributes. So this contributes just one, therefore we can freely add this factor. And then we have a very nice form because this is now M tilde minus T times BHG times T times M to the minus one. Okay, and now we have it because this combination here is our M tilde so m hat plus t b h g is m tilde, therefore m tilde minus t b h g is just m hat. And m hat is this block diagonal simpler matrix. So that is what we obtain. We obtain p h times m hat only times t times m to the minus one. So that is very good. And uh, that we can insert here. And once we insert it here, the m to the minus one hat and m hat cancels. So this cancels against that. 
And what remains is only the following is equal to 2i p u h times t to the minus 1 from here. Then the m's cancel. Then the next is the t, so this also cancels times m to the minus 1 times q times e to the i w. And there we have it. This expression is 2i p u h m to the minus 1 q e to the i w, which is identical to that expression over here. So indeed, we have proved our lemma A. The left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Very nice. We needed to go through a few of those matrix identities. And uh, this type of calculation is typical for what we need to do today. So you see, we need to use a lot of these subspace properties to massage expressions by putting the projectors in the appropriate places. But in the end, it boils down to finding the correct relationship, which makes such a simplification, like here going from m tilde to just the m hat, which then cancels. And because of this, we get the appropriate relationship. Okay, so that was the first um, proof of this kind. And now let us go to the second proof, which is uh, done by induction. So we take the result for A, which corresponds to K equal 1, the first derivative with respect to U. And then we now apply additional derivatives with respect to U by induction. And then we prove this expression on the top right. So let us continue with our proof of statement B, done by induction. So we know that it is true for k equal 1. And so by induction, we will now assume that it is true for k, um, which is 1 or bigger. And then we go from k to k plus 1. And going from k to k plus 1 means that we apply k plus 1 derivatives. And I write it immediately in this form. So here we have k derivatives. And here we have yet another one applied onto e to the i w. Now, by uh, induction, we assume that for k, the uh, right-hand side is valid. Therefore, we can write it down. But this additional derivative remains, and this acts on the entire uh, right-hand side. So uh, I just copy from over there, uh, bracket d by d uh plus i dwh over duh to the power k acting on 1. So the derivatives end here. Uh, close the bracket and apply it onto e to the i w. And now this derivative acts on everything. So this is a product rule in a sense. Uh, it acts on both this factor and on that factor. So we have to use now the product rule. Using the product rule, we obtain two factors, uh, sorry, two terms. And uh, so this uh is a replacement operation. So uh, when the derivative acts on this, it means it acts inside of the capital uh operation. So one term is this uh, and this additional duh derivative acts now on the square bracket inside of it. acting on e to the iw. That is the first term of the product rule. And the second term is we have the same uh operation. Let's just, with this uh, identical square bracket, acting now on the derivative duh of e to the iw. OK. How can we simplify this? So actually here, we cannot simplify much, but it just means that the additional duh derivative acts on the square bracket 
which means essentially we get one additional DUH derivative in this expression. So this will act onto all the WHs which appear here in this expression. But here we can do something because that is again the same left-hand side as in part A or in part B for k equal 1. So by induction we also know what is the result of this derivative, namely it is again the right-hand side specialized to k equal 1 or specialized to part A. So let's say uh with this additional derivative acting on the same square bracket e to the iw and then plus uh of the same square bracket times now uh of uh, i times dwh derivative with respect to uh, all of it acting on e to the iw. And now we have one of these calculational rules that I mentioned in the beginning. We have here a product of two UH operators. And uh, we can combine the arguments of the UH operators if these arguments do not themselves depend on the uh, variable UG, because this contains derivatives with respect to UG. But they don't interfere with this because that indeed contains no UG variable since it's just the WH for the subgraph. So all the UG derivatives coming from here and from here only act on the final e to the iw. So we can combine the arguments. And if you combine the arguments, that is just a factor. This is just one factor, and we can place it anywhere inside of this argument. So for example, we can place this factor here at the front. If we place it here at the front and then also combine the two UHs, then we just get square bracket and in the front of it, we have duh plus that, which is exactly the square bracket with k plus 1. So that is directly uh, our claim. That is exactly our right-hand side with k equal 1. Therefore, we have completed the proof by induction, and uh, this statement b is indeed correct for all k. So that was not so difficult. Now, the next step is to prove part D. Part D is the most general statement of all. And uh, we will again do it in the same logic by induction. But for the induction, we need to assume everything A, B, and C. C we have not proved yet. We will do it afterwards because it's a little bit more complicated. But we can already assume that C is valid. This then corresponds to the case k equal 1 in part d. And uh, uh, then we can, um, by induction, go from k to k plus 1 in part d as well. And so let's do that first, because the logic is the same as what we have just successfully applied for our part b. So let us now prove part d in the same way as we prove just uh, part D, uh, B, namely by induction. So we assume the validity of A, B, and C, even though C is not yet established, but we assume it anyway. And we assume that even this expression D is valid for K which is 1 or bigger than 1, and then we go from k to k plus 1. Right, and do it exactly in the same way as we just did it before. So we apply k plus 1 d by dt derivatives in this form, d by dt of d by dt to the k of this zh operation minus i d by duh, which is just a polynomial in these derivatives times the determinant of m tilde to the minus d over 2 times e to the iw. And so by induction, of course, we assume that this expression, where we just have k, uh, is equal to the right-hand side. And then we have to apply an additional d by dt derivative. And of course, this is now a long-winded expression. 
let me write it in an abbreviated form, but it's just an identical copy of what we have here at the top. So UH of this sum over J with this binomial prefactor K, uh, J with, uh, let's say, D sub T to the power J of ZH with those arguments times the other square bracket, which is, let's say, the dt plus the dwh uh, derivative to the power k minus j, bracket closed, so it's an abbreviated form, and uh, that is applied on our determinant m tilde to the power minus d over 2 times e to the iw. And now again we have a product rule. The d by dt can be applied onto the uh operation, and it can be applied to the uh, remaining factor. So we get again two terms, and we have to treat both terms. So product rule. So the first term is uh, and inside the uh, we need to apply one more d by dt derivative of the sum, and the sum contains already here some t derivatives to the power j times t derivatives to the power k minus j applied on the determinant minus d over 2 e to the iw. That is the first term, and the second term is the one where the dt derivative acts just on the remaining factor. So let's say uh, all with the same arguments as before, unchanged, times d by dt of the remaining factor determinant to the minus d over 2 times e to the iw. Same logic as before, because now this here simplifies, because that is our expression number c. That is exactly the k equal 1 case of uh, the t derivative. And this t derivative, single t derivative, can also be replaced by a uh operation. And actually, to save space, let me directly insert it here on the blackboard by erasing it. So all of this expression can be replaced by the uh operation with the t derivative of wh. So let me replace it here. Then we have a product of two uh's, uh of i dwh derivative with respect to dt. And that whole thing is applied on determinant of m tilde to the minus d over 2 times e to the iw. And of course, you can now do exactly the same strategy as we had before, because this object and also that one does not contain the ug variables. Therefore, we can combine the arguments of the uh replacement operation. Then we have just one uh here, and we can place this factor, because it's just a factor, anywhere we want in the product. So let us uh, put this factor at uh, this position here, where we have here a combination d by dt plus dwh by dt derivative. Then we have one additional factor of dwh with respect to dt. On the other hand, we need to apply the d by dt derivative, and that again gives a product rule, because we can apply it either here in this factor, which gives here a exponent j plus 1, or we can apply it here, which gives an additional d by dt derivative. So we can combine the u's, or these capital uh's, And so we have actually three terms in our uh's. We have three terms because we have two terms here from the product rule. So one term where the additional d by dt acts here, a second term where the d by dt acts here, and the third term where we have the additional dwh by dt factor. And now, think of it, we can combine the three terms into two terms, namely one term where the d by dt acts here, that means we get here d by dt with the exponent j plus 1 of zh times the other 
bracket with exponent k minus j. Then the other two terms are the one where d by dt acts here and where uh, that is multiplied by the additional factor and we combine those two terms, sum over j. So here first d by dt with exponent j acting on set h and then here we have the round bracket to the power k minus j plus one because this additional d by dt plus the additional i d w h by dt uh, exactly corresponds to increasing the exponent here by one. So out of the three terms we have made the two which have a nice form and all of that is again applied on the same final expression. And now we just have to combine the two terms and these are binomial expressions. So we have these binomial structures. I forgot the binomial prefactors k over j, k over j. And uh, what this is, is just uh, the sum gives nothing but uh with sum over j from zero to k plus one with the binomial k plus one over j with just this dt to the exponent j on set h times the other round bracket with the exponent k plus one minus j and all of that acts on the determinant to the minus d over two times e to the iw. And that is the desired right hand side for our uh, um, case k plus one. That means we have completed the proof. So it's exactly the same steps as we had before, just uh, the writing is a little bit more involved. The last step is this binomial step here. And um, if you have doubts about this, then I will now just um, give a little bit uh, additional hint on how to combine these binomial expressions. But this is just, um, pure combinatorics, um, but I want you to see that the overall structure, first of all, is the same as before. Since that is hopefully clear, let us now look in some detail at this binomial, just to clarify um, that this is really true. Maybe let's do it in a different color. So this binomial expression is the sum over j from 0 to k, and then here we have first of all the structure k over j, and let me just uh, simplify the notation, some quantity a to the power j plus 1 times b to the power k minus j plus k over j times a to the power j times b to the power k plus 1 minus j. This is what we need to combine. And so we can uh, combine it by reshuffling here the summation variables. So we can reshuffle it and always bring it to the form a to the power j plus 1 times b to the power k minus j to have a uniform expression. Then in the first term we don't have to change anything. So this gives a summation j equal 1 to k times k over j times this, um, but in the other term we get, um, we need to uh, relabel our summation variable j to j plus one. That means j goes now, but let's do it in a different way. Let's relabel the variables like this so that we have a to the power j like in the second term and k minus j plus one. So like in the second term and then in the first term we need to replace um, j goes now from one to, um, here we need k over j minus one and j starts at one and goes up to k plus one. Right, 
and then this expression completely reproduces uh, that one here. On the other hand, in the second term, we don't need to change anything, so we have just j from 0 to k, and we have k over j um, times the same expression. Okay, and so now what we need to do is to um, look at what this actually is. So we have, uh, let's combine the summation, j equals 0 to k plus 1. That covers all these terms. And uh, from these binomial expressions, we can factor out a few common factors. So in the numerator, we always have k factorial. And in the denominator, we can factor out j factorial and k plus 1 minus j factorial. Let's do it like this. And then let's look at what the additional factors are. So in order to reproduce k over j minus 1, we need uh, to multiply this with j, because then this becomes j minus 1 factorial, and that is correct. So j times that gives k over j minus 1. And if j is 0, this vanishes, and so that reproduces that the summation goes only from 1 to k plus 1 instead of from 0 to k plus 1. On the other hand here, j goes from 0 to k, and we have just k over j, and that means we need to cancel here this factor k plus 1 minus j. And so if j is k plus 1, then this vanishes, and this reproduces that the summation here actually only goes from 0 to k instead of from 0 to k plus 1. So this is completely equivalent, a to the j times b to the k minus j plus 1. And so if you look at this, then the j cancels and we get k plus 1, which means that uh, this just combines to k plus 1 factorial. And so we have really uh, sum over j from 0 to k plus 1 over k plus 1 over j times the appropriate thing, which is exactly the proof uh, of what I said before. So sorry that it took a little bit longer than expected. But anyway, uh, you can combine this binomial expression with two terms, with prefactor k over j, and different uh, combinations of exponents. You can combine all of it to just one binomial expression. And this binomial expression uh, is, of course, not an accident, but it corresponds to a product rule applied for multifold derivatives. That's just what it is. OK, so lo and behold, it all works out in the way uh, we want it to. So we have also proved our part D, which is the most general expression of our derivative lemma. And so now for the rest of the lecture, we can come to the most difficult part, which is our part C, which is the first derivative with respect to T. And that is actually also the most interesting calculation because it involves more elements as the previous ones. But we will go step by step. And after all, it's actually not so tremendously complicated. So let us now come to the proof of our lemma C, which I wrote again here. So we have the full expression, which appears in a loop integration of the full graph G, which contains the determinant of M tilde. So M tilde is essentially the full matrix M, but where the T dependence is essentially factored out, the remaining T dependence resides in this T times BHG block matrix. So this is the essential part of the semantic polynomial to the power minus d over 2 times the usual exponential e to the iw. Both of these quantities are t-dependent. M tilde is t-dependent because of that t times bhg. And w is, of course, t-dependent because of uh, all of these t-dependencies here coming from here, from here, and from here. The claim is that we can replace the derivative of this by the derivative of the subgraph wh with respect to t. And then the subgraph is inserted into the full graph by this uh, insertion operation uh, where the q is replaced by this derivative operator here. That is the claim. And so we need to work a little bit to prove this claim, because as you will see, by taking all the derivatives, quite a few interesting and different terms arise. And we will have to prove the equality of each of those terms. 
And we will first look at the left-hand side and manipulate it until we get a nice form. And then we look at the right-hand side and show at the end that uh, the two sides are equal. So let us begin with the left-hand side. The left-hand side of this equation is uh, written here, of course. And if we can de take the derivative, then we get immediately two terms because of the product rule. And the first term is minus d over 2 times the derivative of the t determinant. So we get determinant of this m tilde to the power minus d over 2 minus 1 times the derivative d by dt of the determinant of m tilde itself times the rest e to the iw. So this is the first term of the product rule. Then the second term plus the derivative of e to the iw gives just the determinant to the power minus d over 2 times i times dw derivative with respect to dt times e to the iw. And this is then just the product. And here we have the full w with derivative with respect to t. Okay, so obviously we first need to figure out what is the determinant of m and its derivative with respect to t. And for that, you should note that if you have any determinant, let's say, of a matrix A which depends on t, let's say A is a matrix which depends on t, then you can always write a determinant as an exponential matrix valued exponential function of e to the trace of the logarithm of the matrix A. So that is simple to understand because the determinant is a product of the eigenvalues of the matrix M. The trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. And so if you sum the log of the eigenvalues, you get uh, exponential gives back the product of all the eigenvalues. So this is an identity. But now taking the derivative is uh, easy because derivative of an exponential function reproduces the entire exponential function, first of all. And then we get the inner derivative. And the inner derivative is trace of the log of A. And uh, derivative of log is matrix A to the minus 1 times derivative d by dt of the matrix A. And so here we have back the determinant, and here we have the trace of this matrix. So in our case, our matrix A is uh, the matrix M tilde. And M tilde has a t-dependence. So d by dt A, in our case, is d by dt of the matrix M tilde, but M tilde is M hat plus T times BHG, and M hat is completely T independent, and therefore we simply get BHG. That's all. And so therefore we can plug it back in. This gives the determinant, and so this derivative here gives the determinant times 1. That means the minus 1 here drops out times the trace. And so let's say this is the determinant once again to the power 1 times the trace of m to the minus 1 times bhg. Very simple. And on the other hand, of course, the w, uh, we have already decomposed it. Our w can be written as wh plus w for the reduced graph g over h plus w s. And then this w for the reduced graph is completely t independent. And so the t derivative simply uh, gives us the derivative of w h plus the derivative of this additional object w s. So this is t independent. And uh, let me write down once again this w in full glory. In full glory, the w can be written as q transpose times the t matrix to the minus 1. And now let me write it in a suggestive way. Namely, let me write m hat to the minus 1 plus m tilde to the minus 1 minus 
m hat to the minus 1 times t to the minus 1 times q. So what did I do? Actually, I only need m tilde to the minus 1 because that's what it is. But I added and subtracted m hat. And so this means that this term gives our wh and that term gives our ws. So, and this gives our wh and also wg over h, but in the t derivative, the wg over h doesn't matter. And so we have a direct expression of our ws if we want to. And so just let me actually maybe, yeah, let me write it here in the, into this box so that we can store it for later purposes. So the left-hand side of our lemma C takes the following form. We get a curly bracket times the original determinant to the power minus t over 2 times e to the iw. And what is in the curly bracket? First we get minus d over 2 times the determinant uh, just reproduce it itself and we get times the trace of the full m to the minus 1 times bhg. That is the first term. And the second term gives this plus i times dwh with respect to t plus i times dws with respect to dt. And for the dws, we may insert this form um, in order to further uh, disentangle it. But this is our left-hand side, first of all, and let us store it in this form, and uh, this should be compared with the right-hand side later. Okay, so this is the final result for the left-hand side, and so let us now turn to the right-hand side. So for the right-hand side, let us first look at the structure. So the right-hand side has this structure of uh with some arguments applied onto the determinant to the minus d over 2 times e to the i w. So the first thing is we should look at the argument of this uh. The argument of the uh is this derivative of the small wh, which is the same as here. So let us uh, write this, uh of i times dwh by dt. So this is the first thing that we should look at and bring into an optimal form. So this is explicitly, we should do the replacement. So we should write down wh, take its t derivative, d by dt and then do the replacement. So the replacement where q is replaced by this q partial at the top right. So the t derivative, let's not really evaluate it yet, but let's just uh, write it here. And then our wh is this with the replacement q delta transpose times t to the minus 1 times m hat to the minus 1 times the projection operator onto the h subspace t to the minus 1 times um, q uh, partial again. Okay, so this is the full complete expression after applying the replacement rule. So we have here these derivatives. Okay, so we can now um, insert the expression for this q partial. So this uh, expands then because we get a sum here and we get a sum there and each term in the sum may be simplified somewhat. So the first term that we get is, of course, just the normal Q itself, which gives then back the WH. So I times D by DT of the normal Q, Q transpose T to the minus 1, M hat to the minus 1, PH, T to the minus 1, normal Q. And as I said, before we forget it, this is nothing but the normal i times dwh uh, divided by dt. But now it goes on. We replace the q partial 
by this additional term, and so we get a mixed term. The mixed term appears twice, and so we can just uh, multiply it with a factor two because the entire expression is symmetric. So we get plus two times i times the t derivative of the mixed expression. So let's put the mixed term onto the right. So we have here the normal q, and here on the right we have i over two bht times the projector p u g times d by d q transpose. And in the middle we have the same, t to the minus one m hat to the minus one p h t to the minus one. Okay, so this is our mixed term. And uh, then the final term, where uh, in both Q deltas we take the BHG term. I times D by DT of twice the BHG term. So we get at the very left the, the derivative D by DQ. Then PG, I just copy from there, but in reverse order because it appears as a transpose. PG, BHG, which is a symmetric matrix, times I over two, then T to the minus one, M hat to the minus one, T to the minus one, projector PH, then times I over two again, BHG times PG D by DQ transpose. So it looks awfully complicated, but the system is clear. So here we have our part from the Q delta. Here we have our part from the Q delta transpose. And in the middle, we have whatever we always have for the WH. And the I times D by DT is just acting at the front. Let us analyze the structure of this. So this is now complete. This is our UH operation. It has three lines three expressions. The first was a simple expression, which is nice, which, by the way, already appears on the left-hand side. So here, that term completely cancels that term, so we have already a first equality between left-hand side and right-hand side. But let's look at the second line. The second line has a structure, d by dq, and uh, so it's written here in matrix notation, and we will often use it in matrix notation, but just to make it super clear, this can be also viewed like d by dq with index i times some constant prefactor xi. This is really the structure. So it's a first derivative with respect to the q variables times some coefficients. Similarly, this is a structure where we have two derivatives with respect to Q variables. So here we have it nicely in matrix notation, index free, but we can also write it as xij with two indices, ij times two derivatives, d by d qi times d by d qj, just to make the structure very clear. So this is a second derivative with respect to all the Q variables times some constant coefficients. Now, we have still not evaluated our t derivative, and uh, we can do that now. For our t dependence, we can note the following. So our t dependence appears in two ways. First way is the t to the minus one, and the second way is uh, sometimes, um, okay, actually here it doesn't, but sometimes in other places, the m tilde appears, and m tilde contains explicitly t times bhg. But here it actually doesn't appear. But in general, there are these two instances of t dependencies, and in particular, t to the minus one. Just to memorize it, this is this, t, t to the minus one, one, one. And so in order to evaluate the t derivative, for sure it's good to know the derivative of this. So let me just denote it, t to the minus one dot is the derivative d by dt of t to the minus one, and that is of course the simple matrix one minus one over t square zero, zero. So this is again a block matrix. It has a one here in the uppermost block, 
uh, that here in the next block and then zeros. So it's also um, uh, like a projection operator on this H subspace, by the way. So this is our T dependence. And uh, then sometimes we got get expressions like T to the minus one acting on BHG. And so for that we can notice T to the minus one times BHG. In particular, if we also have this projector here, this projector here means that only the upper right block of that um, matters, and then only the upper block of the T to the minus one matters. And so this gives then just a factor small t times BHG times PG. So in such expressions, which appear, for example, here, T to the minus one times BHG, the matrix can be just replaced by a factor with small t, and then applying the t derivative is, of course, much simpler. So we should take this into account in order to simplify our expressions as much as possible. And so I think, actually, let us write here some simpler forms of our expressions. So simplify these expressions, and uh, so we have three lines. The first line is already perfect because it matches the left-hand side, but let's massage a little bit the second line with this first derivative with respect to um, QI. So this second line in uh, this abbreviated notation can now be simplified as follows. First of all, the i over 2 times 2i gives just a minus 1. Then um, this here, t to the minus 1 times bhg, just gives this uh, famous factor small t that can be combined with this. So we get d by dt of q transpose. And then let's put it here, factor t times matrix t to the minus 1. And then the rest, m hat to the minus 1 ph bhg. And then this projector can be left out because of this uh, existing projector already times uh, d by the q transpose. And so um, actually this derivative now acts only on these t dependent quantities. So the derivative can be obtained. Let me just write it here by deleting this. Derivative of t times matrix t to the minus 1 gives Q times derivative of small t is 1, so t to the minus 1 plus t times t to the minus 1 dot. Okay, as simple as that. This is our expression for this uh, line with first derivatives. And here on the right, I express it again in nice index free matrix notation, and it involves um, this maybe strange looking expression, but this is the only t dependence here, and the rest is rather simple. Let's do it in the same way for uh, the second derivative expression. So the third line here, the third line here has which prefactor? So we get i over 2 times i over 2 times i gives uh, minus i over 4. minus i over 4. And then from uh, the bhg times t to the minus 1, we said that just gives a factor of small t. So the matrices t to the minus 1 drop out and get replaced by small t. And uh, we have it twice, so we get small t square. So the only thing is that we obtain d by dt of the variable small t square. That's the only t dependent, so it's very simple. And um, so let me write the next factors. And then the next factors are simply d by dq times projector pg bhg. Then only m hat to the minus 1. That's the only remaining term. Uh, the t matrices have canceled. The projector can be left out because uh, there is already this projector here, which uh, has the same effect. Then another BHG times 
the projector can be left out times d by dq transpose. And so again, we can just uh, on the blackboard evaluate the t derivative. So this gives two times t, two times t times one over four gives in the end minus i over two times t. Okay. Minus i over two times t. That is the entire prefactor of this expression. Very good. So now we have an expression and the structure of our right-hand side. In summary, the right-hand side has two, ter three terms. The one which already corresponds to the left-hand side, then a term with first derivative and a term with a second derivative. And now all of these terms need to be applied onto this because so far we have only dealt with this UH structure and now these derivative operators need to be applied on the remaining object. Excellent. Let me delete, um, ah, okay. Let me actually write it here because then we have a nice set of boxes which uh, is our summary. So the right hand side can also be expressed as a curly bracket applied on the original expression. And what is the curly bracket in the right hand side? The curly bracket is first of all from the UH, uh, the first line i to the i times dWH derivative with respect to dt. Then the second term plus um, x i times d by d q i and the third term this x i j times the second derivative d by d q i d by d q j where for these expressions we have obtained this simplified form. And now the right hand side should be equal to the left hand side and so we already see that the first term matches, but the rest doesn't obviously match, so we have some work to do. For example, you see here an interesting term which explicitly involves the dimensionality d. There is no obvious uh, term like this here. And we have the ws. ws uh, is this mismatch here, m tilde minus m hat. Uh, and uh, so this has to be somehow found in those expressions. So we have to work a little bit more. And that is what we will do next. Okay, let us go on with our proof of uh, lemma C. Here we have again left hand side, right hand side should be equal. And we need to step by step um, bring the right hand side into a form which matches the left hand side. And I propose to start by looking at a term with two derivatives and evaluate it. So evaluate first the term with two derivatives so this term has two effects if we act with it on uh, the right hand side the following happens so the second derivative of dqi dqj of e to the iw so the determinant does not depend on the variables q only the e to the iw depends on the q's and so now we act with the second q derivative on this exponential and so we get again a chain rule and a product rule so the first derivative pulls down one factor iw derivative with respect to q and then the second derivative can either act on the w that we pull down or again on the exponential function and that is why we get the following structure on the one hand we get i times the second derivative of w with respect to two q's and on the other hand we get the product of two derivatives iw derivative with respect to qi times iw derivative with respect to qj and all of that is multiplied 
with the exponential e to the iw. So we get two completely different looking terms and both are interesting and um, uh, both should be computed separately. Right, and actually let me therefore optimize our box here that we had. Let me optimize the box because we can now replace, I think here, to make it um, nicer looking and to make the structure even better visible. The second line here is now replaced by what we have calculated over there. So by these two terms, so we have the two terms here in the uh, curly bracket. So one i times the second x i j times the second derivative of w with respect to q i q j. And another term x i j times i w with respect to q i and i w with respect to q j. Okay two terms. And actually we can uh, directly also do the uh, similar thing here because this first derivative with respect to qi just pulls down one factor of iw. So I can directly insert here i times dw derivative with respect to qi and then this is just a product times the remaining factor outside the curly bracket. So this is the first thing. And now we can decide by which term we start. We have now four terms in the lower box. Let us start with a term with two derivatives acting on the single w. Let's say, say let evaluate term three on the right hand side. So what is this term three? Where two derivatives act on the same w. So w is equal to Q transpose times matrix M to the minus one times Q. And now we have to remember that the Qs are actually vectors and each entry of the vector is a Lorentz four vector again. So actually these objects have Lorentz indices as well. Let's call these Lorentz indices Q nu and they are contracted Q nu. So every entry has the same Lorentz index nu and the Lorentz indices are contracted in the appropriate ways. Similarly, the derivatives with respect to the Qs, they have also Lorentz indices. So if we are really precise, then the second derivative of uh, W is actually a derivative with respect to a variable Qi with Lorentz index mu and another um, Qj with Lorentz index, let's say, rho, and then this is contracted with a metric tensor G mu rho. That's what we really have. And now when we evaluate it, then the following happens. So the first derivative gives us, uh, so this, since this is symmetric, it gives a factor two times uh, the derivative of the first Q factor, and then we get the Kronecker uh, delta between the index rho and nu, and of course a Kronecker delta between the index j and whatever index we have here. So we get uh, the appropriate matrix index j from the remainder. So we get a factor two, as I said, and the Kronecker delta between those two Lorentz indices. And then what remains is uh, the remaining variable q with Lorentz index rho. Then we take a second derivative with respect to the remaining q variable with Lorentz index mu. This acts on the remaining q rho, so we get a Kronecker delta or metric tensor between mu and rho and the appropriate matrix indices. So we get matrix indices m to the minus one ji times the metric tensor from the derivatives mu rho times this contraction g mu rho. And so here you have it. Here now appears the contraction of two metric tensors which gives the dimensionality d and we have found a term in the right hand side which has the chance to cancel this d dependent term on the left hand side. So the d on the right hand side appears from this contraction of Lorentz indices. And again we assume here that in dimensional regularization the contraction of metric tensors gives d corresponding to having d dimensional momenta. Okay, 
So this is 2D times the matrix n to the minus 1 with indices ij. What happens if we multiply this with the correct prefactor? So the correct prefactor is i times uh, the matrix xij. So the true term 3 in the curly bracket is 2d times i, because of the explicit i, times xij times m to the minus 1 ij. So this is the trace of this matrix X times the matrix M to the minus one. Okay, and so this is nice, and it really looks very similar to um, the structure we have here at the top, because there we also have a trace of M to the minus one times an additional matrix, and we can hope that this will actually be the same as the term at the top over there. And that is true, we just have to calculate a little bit. So now let's go about it. Um, let's do this calculation. So let's plug in 2d times i times the trace and let us explicitly plug in our xij. So the xij is this inner matrix this is the prefactor of our two derivatives, including that here. So we get minus i over 2 times the variable t. And then this matrix, projector pg, bhg, m hat to the minus 1, bhg. Um, and then our matrix, m to the minus 1 from over there. That's the result. And so now we have to massage this, of course, in a clever way. Good. So what is the, um, what can we do? So first of all, we can replace um, Actually, did we make a mistake over there? I think we did because we should have here m tilde to the minus 1. Remember, because this trace appeared from the derivative of the determinant of m tilde. So what we have here is m tilde to the minus 1. And so I would like to bring this here to the form of m tilde. So m to the minus 1 is t to the minus 1, m tilde to the minus 1, t to the minus 1. So that is the first thing that we can do. Then, uh, this pg, uh, we can pull through the pg. So if we pull it here, we, we get ph. If we pull it here, we get pg again. So we can freely add here a pg. Then we see that this t to the minus 1 T matrix just acts on the G space, and in the G space, this T just gives rise to uh, a factor plus one. So this T matrix can be left out again, and then we have here just M tilde, which is nice. On the other hand, this T matrix here, this T matrix, uh, if you use cyclicity of the trace, it also acts on a PG, so it also gives just plus one. So we can leave out those um, T matrices, and we have replaced our M by M tilde, M tilde to the minus 1. After we have uh, used this PG for this purpose, we can leave out the PG again, because uh, this single PG is enough. Then what else can we do? We have here t times bhg, and t times bhg is nothing but, um, let's say, let's put the t here, then we have t times bhg. t times bhg is nothing but the difference between the full m tilde minus m hat. So this is m tilde minus m hat. And so then we can write down what we have in total. 2di times minus i over 2 times the trace of what? bhg 
times the projector PG. And uh, then we have here m to the minus 1, m tilde to the minus 1, and in between we just only have m tilde minus m hat. So if we take the m tilde term, m tilde cancels against m tilde to the minus 1, and what remains is m hat to the minus 1. If we take the m hat term, this cancels against the m hat to the minus 1, and what remains is m tilde to the minus 1. And that's all. All the other factors could be removed. Therefore, our trace ends here. So it's uh, really simple. And now you can do something else. Namely, let me do it in red here. What is the trace of BHG times M hat times a projector? This is a block diagonal matrix. This is a block of diagonal matrix. So a product of a block of diagonal times a block diagonal matrix is block of diagonal. Therefore, the trace of this product is zero. The trace of this product is zero. That means in the trace we can get rid of this m hat. This is not block diagonal. Therefore, this does not give a vanishing trace, but it's the only thing that remains. It's the only thing that remains, and so we can factor out the minus one. Together with this, 2 times 1 half, this is just d, times minus 1. So we get minus d times the trace of projector pg times bhg times m tilde to the minus 1. Now we are always almost there. The difference is just the 1 half and the additional projection operator. How can we deal with that? Actually, uh, um, the point is the two blocks, the H block and the G block, they give the same result here in the trace. So actually this PG can be replaced um, by PH gives the same, or it can be replaced by one half PG plus PH, so it, which is just one half. How can we see that? by using cyclicity and the symmetry of all the matrices. By using cyclicity of the trace and uh, the symmetry of all the matrices, so all the matrices are equal to the transpose of themselves. So if we use a cyclicity, then we can bring the PG here to the back. Then we can use that the same is equal to its transpose. Then the order gets reversed, M tilde, BHG, times uh, PG again, and then the PG appears suddenly at this position between BHG and M tilde. And so we can see that this is the same as minus D times the trace of BHG times PG here times M tilde to the minus one. But then we can bring it back to the original position and then it becomes a pH here. So you see that this expression is the same as the one where you have pH at the same place and pH plus pG together. You can also do the average between the left hand side and the right hand side and the average of pG plus pH is just one half. So this is equal to minus D over two of the trace without projector BHG M tilde to the minus one. And that is exactly the term on the left hand side. This is equal to term on the left hand side. That means that this expression here is completely equal that expression over here. So we have proved already the equivalence of two terms, namely this term is equal and these terms are also equal. That is very nice and very beautiful and successful. So now we have to do the rest. The rest are those terms where we have just single derivatives acting on W and that should be connected to our WS. So let us do that next. So let us evaluate 
the other terms and let us start with term two, let's call it term two in the curly bracket, which is this term with a single derivative. So this term i times xi d by dqi can be written if I plug in all the full forms for it over there, i times what we have at the top of the right blackboard, minus i times q transpose, sorry the transpose is missing there, times this uh, strange looking combinations of t derivatives. So this came from a derivative with respect to t, times m hat to the minus one, pH, bHg, d by the q transpose. And this acts now on w, let's put the w here, and so this acts on w, so this derivative with respect to q transpose acts on q transpose m to the minus one times q. And so of course evaluating this derivative is very easy, so we get a symmetry factor two because of two derivatives, this is symmetric again, so we get just two times m to the minus one times q, which gets multiplied with all the rest. So the two factor can be put into the front, minus two i times q transpose, and then we have this remaining uh, object. We need to copy it. And here we just get m to the minus one times q. So it's a direct nice matrix multiplication. And so let us now say that all the term involving this t to the minus one matrix, let's call it star, and let us not consider it any further because I can already announce this will cancel later. So let us not modify it anymore. Let us only uh, try to simplify the other term involving this object here. Therefore, I will just call it star minus the rest, star minus two times i times q transpose. And so here we have now t dot to the minus one times m hat to the minus one. And now let's put the t factor at this position here, h times t bhg m to the minus one times q. And so now we do a similar uh, kind of tricks as we did here. First of all, of course, we notice that we can put a projector either into this position or we can put it into this position or we could put it into that position, then it would be a PG. And here we can replace this by, let me do it here, by T to the minus one M tilde hat, uh, M tilde to the minus one times T to the minus one. And then since we can freely add here a projector of PG, then this acts on the T matrix, then this T matrix just gives one again, because it acts on the G space only. So this is trivial. On the other hand, after we did all that, we can put the projector also into this position here. So let's put the projector into this position. This is the same because this is block diagonal and now we can replace this again by M tilde minus M hat. And then we have this, let's get rid of this t to the minus one. So you see nicely m hat to the minus one, m tilde minus m hat, m tilde to the minus one. So this gives a very simple combination, which is the same as what we did already over there. So this is star minus two i q transpose t to the minus one dot pH. And then we have here this combination, so m tilde cancels that one, and what remains is m hat to the minus one, and here m hat cancels, and what remains is m tilde to the minus one. And what remains is this t to the minus one, we didn't get rid of that, times q. 
So this is our final expression. And actually, this pH is not necessary either because this T dot uh, was contains a projection because it has zero, zero in the lower block. So actually the pH is superfluous and we can just drop it without changing the expression. And so we have really a nice and simple form of this term. And at this point we cannot do more, but we have to watch out later that uh, we obtain similar expressions and so we can cancel them. Good, so therefore let me delete the upper blackboard. And then what we uh, uh, need to do is to look at the fourth term here with two products or two factors of uh, first W derivatives. So evaluate the final term, term four. So this is then xij times i dw by dqi times i dw by dqj. And this is a matrix multiplication. So let us use this uh, nice form. Uh, sorry, where is it? Uh, yes, so this is actually the expression and we just need to apply it twice on uh, W. So here we have in the middle a matrix and on the left we have a Q derivative and on the right we have a Q derivative. And uh, since the W is symmetric, it's Q transpose M to the minus one times Q. So we can uh, bring it into a nice matrix multiplication by multiplying one derivative from the left and one derivative from the right, and then we have an index-free, beautiful form for this. So this is then uh, minus i over two times t, that is the prefactor, and then from the left derivative of w, we get two times i, two from a symmetry, and i from i w, times q transpose times m to the minus one. Then we have the matrix in the middle, pg, bhg, m hat to the minus one bhg. And then we have times the right derivative, which is two i times m to the minus one times q. So that is our expression. So it's a nice matrix multiplication, index free and q transpose and q on the left and right and matrices in between. So let's uh, combine the factors in an appropriate way. So what factors? We have i over two times two i times two i. So this gives overall two times i cubed times minus one. So this is plus two i. Let us put the t factor in front of the bhg because then we can again apply such replacement rules as we did before. And let's replace the m to the minus one again by t to the minus one, m tilde to the minus one, times t to the minus one, and as we had before, so this t to the minus one can be dropped because it uh, appears next to a pg operation. And the same happens here, so we can just replace this by m tilde to the minus one, times t to the minus one. So that is what we can do. The t will come here, and uh, we will do those replacements and then we get 2i times q transpose on the left, then t to the minus one, m tilde to the minus one, projector pg times t times bhg, uh, times m hat to the minus one, then bhg, m tilde to the minus one, t to the minus one, and q. Okay, and uh, then we can again say we can put this projector, we can pull it through and put it, for example, equivalently 
uh, at this position here if we want, and this can be replaced by m tilde minus m hat as many times before. So this PG can be put somewhere else and then we can get here this usual cancellation again. So we get um, two i q transpose t to the minus one. And uh, so where should we put the projector? So let's put it here, PG. Then we get t to the minus one and here we get the cancellation. Once we get m hat to the minus one and once we get minus m tilde to the minus one. And then the remaining factor is BHG times m PG m tilde to the minus one, t to the minus one, and q. Now we should be able to observe the cancellation that I announced before, namely star. The star term is minus i minus two i times t to the minus one times m hat to the minus one times bhg times a projector, so this is equivalent, times m tilde to the minus one times t to the minus one. So I didn't write it over there with, there it's still m, here it's m tilde times t, but this is the same thing. So it's clear that this is equal to minus the star from above, and this is the announced cancellation. Therefore, the only thing that we need to uh, further manipulate is the m tilde term. So let's say minus star minus the remaining term 2i q transpose t to the minus 1 m tilde to the minus 1 bhg pg m tilde to the minus 1 t to the minus 1 times q. So, and we can ask uh, how we can further manipulate it. And uh, so what we see here is that it is almost a symmetric expression. Q transpose and Q on the left and right. Then T to the minus one to the left and right. M tilde to the minus one left and right. And in the middle, we have BHG. That is an interesting expression. We can further simplify it in a similar way to what we had before by symmetrizing. If we symmetrize it and use that all matrices are actually equal to their transpose, if we symmetrize it, then the PG is suddenly here. Everything else remains the same. And then we can use the PG operation, put it back here, and then it becomes a PH. So this is equal by symmetrization to minus star equal to the same term, everything the same except for pH here. And so therefore it is also equal to the average between these two. And the average between these two is one half PG plus one half pH. This is just one half times the unit matrix. So it's also equal to minus star minus two I times all the same times one half all the same. And so this is then just minus star times so minus one i times the remaining expression q transpose t to the minus one m tilde to the minus one bhg m tilde to the minus one t to the minus one times q. And this is now really a completely symmetric expression. So and now we can summarize all we have and show completely the equivalence of the left and right hand sides of the two equations. Remember that what we have now achieved is we have computed, let's say, these two terms. In the computation of these two terms, the star cancels and what remains are two remaining objects, namely this minus two i term with these in the middle, minus one i term with this symmetric expression. And that should hopefully be equal to the i dWs by dt.
And that we can now prove, and that is very straightforward and very direct. And so let us just end the lecture by showing this equality. Right. So I deleted part of the blackboard. Let me just uh, put this equation that we obtained last onto the upper blackboard and then clean it entirely so that we have collected here uh, the result of term two plus term four. So this is the result of our term two and this is the result of our term four. So the sum of the two is the following. The star goes away and uh, this gets added to minus i times q transpose times t to the minus 1 m tilde to the minus 1 bhg m tilde to the minus 1 t to the minus 1 q. And then these two terms should be equal to in the upper box dws by dt. And that is what we should prove. And so let's prove it, but first delete the blackboard completely. We have put everything into an optimum form. We just need to remember now what is actually our i dws by dt. So the ws was the remainder and it can be expressed in our variables that we have over there just by the remainder t to the minus 1 times this difference m tilde to the minus 1 minus m hat to the minus 1. So this is actually our ws. And so let us take the t derivative. Now what happens if we take the t derivative? It's extremely simple because the t dependence resides in the t matrix, which appears in a symmetric form here and there, and it resides in the m tilde. That is t independent and q is also t independent. Therefore we get three terms from the t derivative. Two of them are equal because this and that give the same derivative, so we get a factor 2, 2i two times the derivative q transpose, where we just can here say t to the minus 1 dot times m tilde to the minus 1 minus m hat to the minus 1 times t to the minus 1 times q. This is the first term, and the second term is the derivative of m tilde, so plus i times q transpose, t to the minus 1, derivative of m tilde with to the minus 1 with respect to t, t to the minus 1 times q. Right, and so can we already compare? This here looks very similar to that term at the top of the blackboard. Is it equal? I think it is equal because we have 2i minus 2i q transpose t minus 1 dot. And here we have this bracket, here we have the negative bracket, and the rest is the same. So this immediately cancels one of the terms. So this is already perfect. And uh, then we have to look at the second term, let's say, let's say first line. So the first line is already under control. And in the second line, we need to evaluate the matrix derivative plus i q transpose t to the minus 1. And what is a matrix derivative? We get minus m tilde to the minus 1 times the derivative of m tilde without minus 1 times m tilde to the minus 1. This is just an ordinary matrix derivative, t to the minus 1 times q. And now what is the derivative of m tilde? m tilde is what is there in the round bracket at the top. The t derivative is just bhg. bhg, nothing else. And then this should sound familiar because it's equal to that second line here, minus bhg minus i, and all the rest is identical. So this is indeed equal to what we had here in what we called term 2 plus 4. That means our dotted terms are also equal, and that means we have completely established left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. That means our proof of lemma C is complete.
that is the end of today's lecture. So we have established a very important and powerful lemma on the relationships between all sorts of derivatives with respect to all interesting variables t and u for our subgraph. And we have expressed all the derivatives acting on full graph expressions by derivatives acting on subgraph expressions where the subgraph needs to be inserted into the full graph with our operation u of h. And of course, as an outlook, uh, you can already start to see that uh, this will allow us to prove much more general relationships uh, which we use in uh, renormalization, which correspond also to our example calculations. Because these relationships um, are the generalizations of our observations for the concrete two-loop calculation, where the W for the full graph and also its second T derivative could be related to expressions from the subgraph. And in using those relationships, we could prove that subdivergences cancel. And what remains is uh, superficial divergences, which are polynomial in the momenta and can be cancelled by local counter terms in a Lagrangian. And this lemma that we prove today is the basis of the general proof of uh, such properties. So this is the central um, point of the proof that in general you can renormalize Feynman graphs by this uh, Forrest formula and R operation. Very good. But this ends the lecture here. And in the next lectures, we will actually do those general proofs using the lemma that we have established here uh, based on this nice alpha and u variable formalism. So thanks.